Shall we open our Bible today to the book of Numbers? I got to tell you that Leviticus was a fun book because it had to deal with pastors and worship and holiness and all that stuff. But I'm thinking now that maybe Numbers might be the one I really need more than anything else. And you think, well, why would you say that? Well, when you find out during this study, you're going to realize that we probably are in the book of Numbers right now. 39 years of going nowhere, around and around in circles, and not making one inch of progress in the Lord. That probably is where most of the country is today. We need to begin to move out. We need to begin to live by faith. We need to quit feeling sorry for ourselves, and we need to understand we're not in this thing by ourselves. We have a great God that is with us. So when you say to me, hey, Pastor Steve, I'm in the wilderness, I'm going to correct you. I'm going to say to you, with God in the wilderness. You're never going to be apart from God. He's always going to be with you. No matter where you go, He's going to be there. And so you can't say, I'm in the wilderness. No, you have to say that God is with me in the wilderness. And by the way, it was in that wilderness that God fed them the manna. And it was in that wilderness that God opened the Red Sea. And God opened the seas and the waters and marsh and so on. And that God did tremendous works. And they saw the pillar of fire. And they saw the cloud that covered them. And yet, they did not trust God. And that is a tragic thing. So when I look at this book, I begin to realize there are two groups that we're really talking about. The old generation that is going to perish. Those will be the old wineskins that will not understand anything. And then a whole new generation that God's beginning to rise up or raise up right now. The generation of the kids. And we see that those are probably 20-year-olds. And now we begin to understand what God's doing in our country. Oftentimes, we're too old to change. Well, that shouldn't be it. And we say, well, we're kind of used to this wilderness. No. God can break the wilderness. And by the way, the Bible says that His grace will speak to you in your wilderness. So you might be in the wilderness, but Jeremiah said, my grace is sufficient for thee in that wilderness. And then you remember the Bible says also in the book of Psalms that he'll break the cedar and he'll speak in his voice and break the wilderness completely. In other words, God can bring you out of that. But even like Shidrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they did not want to come out of the fire. And the reason why is they saw Jesus Christ in the fire. They went in bound and they came out loose. And the reason why was because in that fire, God was there. Nebuchadnezzar threw them in and Nebuchadnezzar looked in and said, we, I thought we threw three in. Why do I see forth? And he looks like the Son of Man. Because God was with them in that fire. And God released them in that fire. And they came out of that fire brand new. And sometimes a wilderness experience can really set you on fire for Jesus Christ. It can give you a new hunger, a new heart, a new desire. And so you look at Leviticus, you look at Numbers, you think, man, what am I going to learn? Well, Timothy understood from Paul. Paul, you remember, said to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured, of knowing whom thou hast learned them. And from a child thou hast known the Holy Scripture, which are able to make you wise unto salvation, through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now check it out, verse 16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for number one, doctrine, number two, reproof, number three, correction, and number four, instruction in righteousness. And reason why? That the man of God may be perfect or complete or absolute mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And so what Paul is telling Timothy is, listen, you need to stay in the Word and you need to know that every single book, every single word is God's witness to us that God is speaking to man. So when you look at Leviticus and says, I'm going to pass over, don't, because God will speak to you even in that book, in the book of Numbers, the very same way. And one of the great verses, I think, in Romans chapter 15, verse 4, it says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime, in other words, what was written back then, the history, were written for my learning, that through patience and comfort of the Scripture we might find hope. That's a great verse. It says that the things that were written aforetime were written so I would learn, that through my patience and the comfort of the Holy Scripture that God is going to give me hope. And that's where we need. We need a hope. 
right now where we are. And I can look to situations, I can go with emotion, but I need God to heal my heart. And so the book of Numbers is really not a good name. It's an English name, but the Hebrew name is in the wilderness. So it talks about you being in the wilderness for 39 years. The book of Leviticus, it was one month. The whole book was only one month long. Now we're into here, once again, the wilderness. And it kind of does make sense. In Genesis through Deuteronomy, we know them to be the Pentateuchs. And they were written by Moses. So Genesis would be in the beginning or the creation of God, where God elected you and God has predestined you. And then we come to the book of Exodus, which is really the book of Jesus Christ about God's redemption, that through the blood of Jesus Christ, he will bring you into that promised life. And the book of Leviticus is really the work of the Holy Spirit. He will make you holy and he'll sanctify you. And then you come to the book of Numbers and it has to deal with what? Man, numbering men. And what is the issue of that? Failure all the time. So you have God the Father in the book of Genesis creating. You have the Son who's dying for the sins of the world. You have the Holy Spirit that is sanctifying and redeeming. And then you have us, man, who is a typical failure because we will not look to God. And what was to be 11 days through the wilderness ended up being 39 years. Why? Because 10 spies came back with an evil report. All they could see is the giants. They couldn't see really what God said. Caleb and Joshua said, hey, we can do it. But everyone else said, no, there are giants in the land. Well, I'll tell you what, there are giants in our land. And there are walls that we have to conquer. And there's Jerichos that we need to bring down. But God has to do it. And if God says do it, we need to go. And yet we realize, ah, I think I'll stay right where I'm at. And that's the wilderness experience. We've been in this place too long. We've been going around and around too long. It's time to change the marriage. It's time to change the relationship with the kids. It's time to grow up and begin to realize what God's doing. And that means a step of faith. And that means coming out of that danger area. And so the name of the book, they numbered the people twice. The theme of the book is just murmuring and complaining and sadness. I know that's not us, but it's in chapter 11. People are complaining about the food. Food's no good, this and that. I mean, in the third world, they have no food. But boy, I tell you what, if we're not happy with it, what do we do? We complain big time. And Aaron and Miriam, they were complaining about Moses getting married. And who gave you the authority in chapter 12? And so guess what? God dealt with those two. So I know that we don't criticize or we don't judge authority and we don't think people can do the right thing all the time. That's okay. And then Korah and the company, you remember, they attacked Moses. They came after Moses. And they came against Moses. And, of course, they died. And we don't do that. We don't come against people. We don't gossip. You know, not us. Nuh-uh. And we're not doubting and we're not disobeying. But I tell you what, we are definitely wondering in humility what in the world's going on in our life. This is a great book because I think that we can learn something very powerfully in this book. They numbered the people twice at the very beginning and at the very end. And they came up with 605,000 soldiers between the age of 20 and 50 that were willing to fight. So they were now becoming a very strong army. Moses is the author, and the date is around 1405. And the audience, two groups I've mentioned to you. And really, that's probably all we really need to know. But four things I want to show you. Four incredible truths to show you what can happen in your wilderness. Well, Steve, I'm right there. I'm kind of dry, kind of empty, not hearing from God. I'm emotionally wrapped up. I have a great word for you this morning. Number one, manna in the wilderness. He is the bread of life. Turn with me to Numbers chapter 11, verse 8 and 9. Numbers chapter 11, verse 8 and 9. Jesus is that bread of life, and that's what Moses said. He said here in Numbers 11, verse 8 and 9, And the people went about and gathered it, and that would be manna, and ground it in mill, and beat it into mortar, baked it in the pan, made cakes of it, and a taste it was as the taste of fresh oil. And when the dew fell upon the camp in the night, the manna fell upon it. And so that's what happened. God provided for people in the wilderness. So number one, God is providing for you. Doesn't make a difference where you're at. God's going to provide. God's doing a work. God's blessing. And yet the people have changed the taste of it. They had the taste of a sweetness. 
It was like honey until they complained. And then God turned the taste into oil. It was kind of like, yeah. And I think sometimes because we challenge God, we fight with God, we hassle with God, we complain so much, when we finally get ready to do what we have to do, we do it, it's obedient, but it's not sweet. There's not a sweetness in our Christian walk. We just do what we have to do because we don't want to go to hell. Well, that's a terrible way to live. You should be as sweet as honey. The things of your life should be really sweet. There should be a, a joy in your marriage, a sweetness in your marriage. Not because you have to, not because you're married to the bum, but because you actually love the bum. And you understand the bum. I mean, he's a bum. But you are a bum too. You're a bum. He's a bum. You're all a bum. You're all saved under the grace of God. And because of that, you're thinking, thank God there's not another bum i got to live with. I've worked with this guy long enough. He's okay. And so he can become sweet and it's fun. And you can kind of understand each other. He does one thing, you do another. And that's the way it is. And so you want to feed the ducks. He wants to shoot the ducks. You want to have a dog. And she wants a little midget. You know, I don't, you know that's the way marriage is. God, does, God just does it. God makes one strong, one weak, one doesn't cry, one cries all the time. God puts them together to balance things out so you can grow and I can grow and she can grow and things begin to become very sweet in a relationship. And when the sweetness is gone, it's over. And I know I'm in that wilderness of life. So number one, I realized the manna was given. But notice what John said in John chapter 6, verse 57. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the fathers, so he that eats me, even he shall live by me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your father did eat manna and are dead. He that eats the bread shall live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Do you catch it? He's saying, I'm the bread of life. I came down. If you eat of me, you're going to live. Now check it out. You're in a wilderness. No one understands what you're going through. God is speaking, but you're not hearing it. God's word is there, but you're not listening. And sometimes we say, God, you don't care. God does care. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. Cast your burdens upon Him. He's going to minister to your heart. But you're not listening because you're wrapped up in the storm or you're wrapped up in the situation or you're wrapped up in everything else. But God is shouting. And the moment you stop and begin to say, no, wait a second. You're telling me that God's voice is here? I'm telling you God wants you out of the wilderness. And God is going to give you a voice. He's going to speak to you. He's going to provide for you. And He's going to be your God. He's going to be right there. He's never left you. And the moment you calm down and begin to listen, you're going to hear God. And it's going to be a powerful voice. And God's going to minister to your heart. And that is the bread of life. You begin to eat that bread. It becomes a great thing. And we see that. There's a hunger and when there's a hunger for God, that's a wonderful thing. He said the very same thing in, on the sea. In other words, before that storm could leave, Jesus stood and spoke His Word. Jesus wanted them to hear His Word in the storm and then to open their eyes to see who He was. So God will give you the bread of life. God will speak to you His Word. And that's a profound thing when I come to realize what God wants me to do. So here it is. I'm bummed out, so I don't want to get in the Word. No, no. The Bible says I'm going to eat His bread under the enemy. In other words, I'm going to enjoy the Word of God under the camp of the enemy. He gives His Word, and it's going to be in my life. Don't run away. I don't want to get in the Word. You need to get in the Word. I'm bummed out. Does it make a difference? Get in the Word. You need to hear God's voice. You hear my voice. You hear your spouse's voice. You hear your boss's voice. You need to hear God's voice. What is God saying? And the moment you hear that voice, your heart's going to burn. And it's going to shout. And you're going to begin to realize things are beginning to crack open because now you found the answer to life, the bread of life. It's going to set you free. And secondly, not only the bread is mentioned here, but the water of life. Notice in Numbers chapter 20, verse 11, Moses is speaking again about Jesus Christ. He says, Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. And water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beast also. I kind of like that word, the beast also. Because sometimes we just want water for me. But what about your spouse? She needs it too. And when you start drinking, guess what? She gets to drink. 
And when God works in your life, other people get blessed. And if you're happy, your animals are happy. If you're bummed, your animals get bummed. So you have to understand that things happen to you for a reason. But here is that river of God right underneath your feet. It's been there all the time. And all you have to do is dig down a little bit. The manna has been there. It's on the tree. You just have to go get it. Well, I'm kind of bummed. I don't want to go get it. You have to go get it. Well, I don't want to be filled. You have to dig down. There's a point in your life that you have to understand it's going to take a little bit of energy from your part to want the things of God. So if I really want the Word of God, it's right here. Go get it. He humanly gave it to you. Now, I mean, He divinely gave it to you. Now you have to humanly gather it. Or if I need the Spirit of God, you might have to hit your knees and begin to dig that water. But there's a spring underneath of you that's ready to go out. You remember the woman at the well in John chapter 4? Powerful verse. Jesus came to her that day at 12 o'clock. It must have been 120 degrees out in Syria. And here this woman's coming by herself with a bucket. She had no business being there at that time except she was despised by the city. She must have been something that people did not respect because people would come early in the morning, not at that time. But Jesus was waiting for her. And when all of a sudden Jesus was there, he said to her, so you're getting water. And she said, where's your bucket? Well, I don't have a bucket. Well, how are you going to get water? I am the living water. And then he began to speak to her. You've been married five times, and the husband you're with now, you're not even married to. She took off. She left her bucket. Kind of interesting. She did not need what she came for. What she needed was a spiritual feeling, not a physical feeling. She went back into town. She told everybody, come meet the man that told me everything about myself. The city came out. And when they came out, Jesus said, if you drink of her bucket or drink of this well, you're going to thirst again. But if you drink of me, you're never going to thirst again. In other words, I'm going to satisfy the inner means. And sometimes what happens in the wilderness is we pat somebody on the back. It's like dust. It's like they've been walking like a mummy for 25 years. (coughs) You know, and you just pat them and their arm falls off or their eyes falls out. You know, and you want to love a brother, but you you pat them and they're dust and you, you cough and... What happened to you? Well, I'll tell you what needs to be done. You need to be soaking in the Holy Spirit. They need to take you like that clay when it's hard and crusty and dump you into that bucket of water and let you soak. And you're going to get soft and tender and pliable. And you're going to be able to be molded. And God's going to mold you with His fingers, which are the circumstances of your life. So you have a George here, a Bill Hill. You got a job here. You got this. You got that. And God molds you. And when all of a sudden you're fighting with the clay and you're messing with the maker, he'll just put you all together and throw you back in a bucket. I can't work with this clay. It's too stubborn. And all of a sudden bubbles come up. Help, help, help. And so he reaches down and picks you up and puts you back down. You're nice and slimy. He begins to mold you. You get all the way up. I'm perfect. And God says, oh, you're prideful. Pushes you all the way back down. <laughs> so this potter is moving the wheel. He is the one who's spinning the wheel. Too many things are happening in my life. Who's doing that? God. And who has the vision? God. And who has the hands? God. What is the clay talking back to the potter? Go back in the water until you behave yourself. When you come back out and all of a sudden you get all done, praise God, I'm done. Are you really? Really? Then he picks you up and takes you over and puts you in an oven. Shuts the door at 1,500 degrees and smiles at you through the door. And you're screaming at God, what are you doing? And God says, I'm right here. I don't care. Open the door. And that's where my cookies come in. Cookies, 350, 12 minutes, great chocolate chip cookies. What do I do? Open the door, shut the door, open the door, shut the door. 45 minutes later, cookies aren't done. Why? Because I do exactly what I do with God. I stop God, I start God. I stop God, I start God. I won't let God work in my life. And so the work of the Holy Spirit, Jesus said the very same thing. If any man thirst after me, let him come unto me, and out of his belly shall come forth torrents of living water. And listen to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. Did all drink the same spiritual drink? They drank from that spiritual rock that followed them. That rock is Christ. So two things right off the bat. I'm in this wilderness. Let me ask you a question. Have you heard God? No. Are you sensing God? No, then something's wrong. Your heart's not right. Because in that wilderness, God is trying to teach you something. 
And God is trying to work in your heart. You have to yield to the work of His Holy Spirit. And so, so important. But number three, there's a serpent in the wilderness too. And he's the healing of life. Kind of interesting. And Numbers chapter 21, verse 9. It says, Moses made a serpent of brass, put it upon the pole. That's where you get the medical thing. And it came to pass that if the serpent had bitten any man, when he had beheld the serpent brass, he was healed and lived. That's exactly what happened. They had sinned. 23,000 have died. And the bites were happening. And people were bitten by a serpent. And Moses made this serpent, stuck it up, and said, as many as look to this will be healed. Well, you're sitting next to a guy. Maybe he's been bitten. Maybe I got bitten. Rob sat next to me. And he's saying, Steve, look to God. Why? He bit me. Why should I look to God? It's just a stick. It's just Moses. It doesn't make any sense. I need medical attention right now. No, look to God. No, I need medical. Suck this blood out, Rob, right now. Hurry up. No, look to God. I don't do it. I'm dead. It takes a step of faith. Exactly the same thing happens in our life. We think we can do it, but we don't look to God. I can handle it. You need to look to God in a very powerful way. Look at what John said in John chapter 3, verse 14. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So there comes a moment of faith in your life. God is speaking. He has the water to once again work in and through your life. But you're going to have to believe. You're going to have to come to a point in your life that no matter how much pain and hurt and agony there is, God is good. And that God is faithful. And God is always right. And you're always wrong. And God is going to help you. But if you don't listen, there's no reason to be in this wilderness one day longer than you need to be. Yes, you've got to get through but not 39 years, not around a mountain for 39 years, not in rebellion and not growing one inch in 39 years. That is stupidity. That is a person that says, listen, I don't want to live by faith. I want nothing to do. I'll tell you what happens. You have no concept of God. Your life is dry. And I tell you what, when God says, look to me, you don't do it. Why? Because you get used to the Shekinah glory. You get used to the rivers opening up. You get used to the river turning into water good like marsh you get used to the things going around why do i need any more in my life because you're in the wilderness god is going to be faithful to you but there's an abundant life and that brings me to the very last point and probably one i really enjoy the most it says here number four he is the star in the wilderness not you you're not a star in the wilderness christ is that star and look at here in a very profound way the star of jacob in Numbers chapter 24, verse 17. He says, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel and shall smite the corner of Moab and destroy all the children of Seth. In other words, there is a ruler coming named Jesus Christ. And what I believe this is talking about is the most important thing of your life, hope. Because if God takes you and begins to speak His Word to your heart, it's a great day. And when the Spirit of God begins to fill your heart, it's a wonderful day. And when you begin to live by faith, man, that is where it's at. But here is where it stops. But that's it. Because I've blown it. I'm no good. I can't do it. I'm just a crybaby. I'm just this. I'm just that. No. Stop. Where is the new ambition? Where is the new man in Christ, the new woman in Christ? Where do things begin to explode again and now you begin to realize you're being revived? This is a brand new day in your life and you're going to take all the pain and put it together and you're going to be used for the glory of God. In other words, this is where God restores the vision, the hope, and the dreams of your life. And he says this, there's a star coming. It's Jesus Christ. That's a great thing to think about. And what happens in my life is I get bummed I go through it, and then I lose heart. I don't want to do it no more. And then God says, Steve, what's wrong with you? Well, you know, I just don't hear your word. Well, why? Well, I just haven't been looking at your word. I don't feel your spirit. Why? I'm still so dry. You know, I'm in the hospital. Stephen, do you have any faith? Not much. Stephen, what about the people? I just want to go to bed. That's a pathetic thing, Stephen. I know. And God begins to show me. 
your heart is wrong. And boy, I turn my heart, it's like Jeremiah, your heart begins to burn. You get, you get me out of the hospital, I want to preach. I want to go for it. And then we read here in Luke 1, 7, 8, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high has visited us. Who is that? Jesus Christ? Coming in the form of a baby who's going to come to Mary. Peter said it this way in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereto ye do well, that you take heed as unto the light that shines in darkness, until the day dawn and the day star rises in your heart. What does that say? God's going to light the fire in your heart again. He's going to put the passion for your husband in your heart again. It can never happen. It can happen. He can make it a torch. He can make it to the point that he opens the door and there you are, grabbing him and just kissing him. What happened to you? I got lit. <laughs> I'm going to light you right now. You know. So all of a sudden things happen. Or you call your kids, come home. And they're waiting for you to lecture them, and you love them. What happened, Dad? I got filled with the Spirit of God. The light went on. And I realized that God made you in His image, and God's responsible for you. I just want to thank God that you're okay. Things change. And it says here, not only that, in Revelation chapter 2, verse 28, I will give him the morning star. He's saying to the church, I'll give you the morning star, but here's the best one. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 16, I, Jesus have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. In other words, what God is saying to you and I in a very profound way is there's no reason to be in this wilderness right now. You've been here long enough. It's time for God to light your heart on fire. How does it work? Well, I'm the bread of life. Are you willing to go gather it? I am. Is it there? It is. You mean I need to get up and go grab it? Grab it. Okay, I can do that. And God speaks to your heart. And all of a sudden, you want that spirit. You're hungry for the spiritual things of life. And you're not getting it from anywhere. Are you willing to dig a little bit? Willing to dig down and hit the stream that's underneath of you? And all of a sudden, that spirit just fills your heart and takes the old wineskins and makes it a brand new tender thing and makes you pliable and flexible and, and begins to fill your heart and you begin to bubble over and people see it and they're affected. And then all of a sudden, faith comes back into your life and you think, you know, maybe I can do this. Maybe I can look to God. Maybe God can heal our family. Maybe God can put things back together. Maybe God can heal the country. Maybe God can do a great work. He can. And all of a sudden, the most exciting thing happens, he lights your light and he makes you a flame. And he gives you ambition and dream, and you finally realize this whole thing has been to get me to this moment of my life. You know why? Because God's never left you. You talk about him not being in your wilderness, he's all over your life. You're just stubborn and won't look to him. You've got to turn to God and let God fill you and bless you and anoint you and use you. Don't give up on God. People can't give you what you want. There's too much pain and agony in this world. Let the Spirit of God break your heart and fill your heart and use your heart and push you out because it's never too late.